It's claimed that the 16th century European church protester and reformer, Martin Luther, said that the Christian church must be profane. If you understand what the word profane usually means, then you might be shocked by Luther's statement. Luther's well known for saying a lot of shocking and offensive things, but this is not one of those occasions. The word profane is often used by people to describe someone or something that is disrespectful towards God or their religion. For example, when someone is accused of uttering profanities, they are being accused of insulting God or religion. But when Martin Luther stated that the church must be profane, he was not saying that it must be irreverent towards God. Far from it. He was referring to the original intended meaning of that word, which was used to describe anything that was outside the temple or a sacred place. Sacred described the people and things inside the temple walls or sanctuary, the special place where the divine dwells and is honoured, while profane referred to what was outside the temple walls, outside the sacred place. So in our contemporary speech, we would choose the word secular instead of the word profane. So maybe a more up-to-date translation of Luther's argument for the reformation of the church was that he wanted to see it become more secular. He wanted the church to be the church outside the walls of cathedrals and getting among common people in common places, such as Marcus, shops, fields and village houses. When Jesus said that his community of disciples is a community that is salt, Luther understood that to mean that the church of Christ is to penetrate and permeate, to spread its witness and influence as widely as possible. Luther said these things more than 500 years ago, and while we celebrate the radical reformation of the church that he and others started back then, there are now contemporary church leaders and reformers who are repeating Luther's message, but of course using different words to say the same thing. And we say that the message is clear that we need to teach and equip sacred people to realize that their secular work is also very sacred work. Or as one Christian leader put it, we need to connect Sunday worship with Monday work. We need to do so because the disconnect is undermining the work of evangelism and discipleship. Listen to what the Center for Faith and Work has argued in one of its many blogs. It states this, The disconnect between Sunday and Monday has not only crippled the church's outreach into the most strategic mission field in the world, it has undermined discipleship by segregating a person's spiritual life from the part of their life that dominates their waking hours, their work. And how often and for how long does this need to be said before we heed the message? Dorothy Sayers, an early 20th century English author and poet, wrote pr prophetically many decades ago when she said, It is the business of the church to recognize that the secular vocation as such is sacred. It is not right for it to acquiesce in the notion that a person's life is divided into the time they spend on their work and the time they spend in serving God. In nothing has the church so lost its hold on reality as in its failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. It has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of their life. So how can the church be profane? How can we bring Sunday worship to meet with Monday work? How do we connect the sacred with the secular? To respond 
to this challenge, let's look at the pastoral advice given by the Apostle Paul to the Christians meeting in the city of Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, Paul wrote, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It is very clear that this advice from Paul is given to slaves, and none of us are slaves. So these instructions that connect the work and labour of slaves to the worship of Christ, well, is that irrelevant to us? And my response to that reasonable question is this. If Paul is telling slaves to transfer their approach to slave labour, and is asking them to regard as sacred their involuntary and menial work for hard taskmasters, then how much more do modern church pastors need to encourage Christians to transform our attitudes and approach to work that is entered into voluntarily, is well remunerated, and can even be personally rewarding? So I would like to suggest three applications from Paul's advice for connecting Sunday worship to Monday work. Firstly, Sunday worship and Monday work are connected because both are about service and serving. Secondly, Sunday worship and Monday work are connected because both are done for God, to please Him and fulfill His purposes. Thirdly, Sunday worship and Monday work are connected because both are honoured and rewarded by God. So let's take the first one. Sunday worship and Monday work are connected because both are about service and serving. In a letter to Christians at Rome, Paul makes one of his very few statements about worship. And in that statement, he describes the nature of worship that God wants from us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do you notice that? According to Paul, the true way to worship God does not primarily consist of singing, praying, reading or learning. It's not that these are unimportant or unnecessary. They certainly are important and necessary. But in the end, the true way to worship God is to voluntarily offer your body with all your mental, emotional and physical abilities as an offering in service to God. These verses that, and the verses that follow confirm that that's what Paul is meaning. And the biblical scholar Ben Witherington made the same observation about these verses when he wrote, as Romans 12, 1 to 12 puts it, the very offering up of ourselves and our activities to God is our logical worship. We serve and worship God through our work, if done rightly. When Paul wrote to Christian slaves in Colossae, he was being entirely consistent with his understanding that Christian worship, and in fact Christian living, is really about serving. And in Sunday worship services, many of us are not serving, we're receiving. Instead, our serving starts, for most of us, after the Sunday service is finished. Paul teaches Christian slaves that when they work for their masters, they are serving their masters, the household, and others who benefit from their work, because work is about using our talents and gifts in the service of others. Now, I think that when you think of work as service, it does change your attitude to what you do on Mondays and the rest of the week. For example, when I became the director of a government tribunal, I held a staff meeting and declared that my Christian faith taught me that our work is about serving others. So I said that we were going to put service back into the label public service. 
Our focus as a tribunal would be on using our combined talents and abilities to provide the best administrative review service we could to Centrelink clients who needed our gifts and talents. When we view work and labour as a call to serve the well-being and welfare of others, we have greater motivation for Monday work. And our Sunday worship becomes an inspiration for that. After Chuck Colson, the legal advisor to President Nixon, was converted to Christianity, he would say, thank God it's Monday, instead of what most workers usually say, which is, thank God it's Friday. The Christian gospel changed his understanding of work, from using it to serve his interests and ambitions, to serving the interests, desires and dreams of other people. Working as serving others gives work a bigger and better purpose and filling in a lot of time to, to collect pay for things we don't really have much time for. Too many live for the weekend or for their vocation or retirement. Whereas if we believe that we were created to work and through work to serve the creation and its creatures, then we will wholeheartedly agree with Dorothy Sayers when she wrote, work should be looked upon not as drudgery, to be undergone for the purpose of making money, but as a way of life in which the nature of the person can find their proper exercise and delight and so fulfill themselves to the glory of God. Work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but a thing one lives to do. So Sunday worship and Monday work come together when we redefine our work and labour as serving others rather than about serving ourselves. as about fulfilling the second great commandment. Secondly, Sunday worship and Monday faith are connected because both are done for God, for His purposes and His pleasure. Paul said that the work being done by Christian slaves was not only to serve the interests of their master and their household, but it's also being done for God. And since they were working for God, all that they do should be done very well. Again, I quote Dorothy Sayers, who says so much about this that is helpful. And she captured Paul's message with the statement, All work done well and for God's glory is Christian work. When God converted me from serving myself to serving Christ, I was eager to learn how to live as a devoted follower of Christ. So I attended Bible studies, listened to sermons twice every Sunday, read many biographies of Christian leaders, and through all that listening and learning, I understood that the best and most sacred work was the work of evangelists, pastors and missionaries. This was the work that really mattered to God. That's what I thought. And therefore, that was the work that I tried to do, but I had to do it after hours and on weekends, such as shopping centre evangelism and door-to-door -door witnessing. When I was doing that, I was feeling I was doing work that really mattered. And my role models were preachers and missionaries. But I soon became annoyed with working at the office five days a week. I felt I was wasting my time and my life. And I resigned myself reluctantly to the fact that I had to work in the office because I was a husband and soon to be a father. I had to pay the bills. But I was frustrated and felt my work even as a social worker, was not genuinely good work, not even Christian work. When I realised that the first great commission from God was the commission to work, to co-create with Him as representatives, then I began to understand that my conversion to following Christ required a conversion and a transformation of my working week. As someone who is employed by Christ, to be his representative and agent in the workplace. I then understood that Christ's commission to evangelize and make disciples does not erase the commission to work. Instead, it enhances and it enriches it. And I also perceived that when I came as a follower of Christ into the office on a Monday, I was bringing Christ with me, this sacred union of Christ with me, we were walking together and working together amongst secularized people in secularized places. I was a frontline missionary with more opportunities than many preachers and overseas missionaries ever had. 
It was soon after this conversion of my work as a service to God and His commission, I was asked by my manager to leave God at home, stop bringing Him to work. This came about because I was just as open about my faith in the workplace as others were about their sexual orientation or cultural practices or political opinions or religious beliefs. That's what is wonderful about the workplace, that it's a marketplace of ideas and beliefs that are traded and exchanged in staff rooms, lunch rooms, and on factory floors. Yes, it did get me into trouble with some, but I was no longer working as if I had some sort of disorder, like a dissociative identity disorder. That's a psychiatric term that describes a person with multiple personalities. Instead, my life is no longer split between a Sunday worshipping personality and a Monday worker personality. I was no longer a closeted Christian worker, but instead, realising the sacredness of work helped me to be out and proud in the workplace. When we see work as the true and proper way to worship God and to bring Him glory, then artistry, architecture, poetry, drama, manufacturing, even accounting... Uh, All these various things we do with the gifts of God enable us to show to secular people in secular places the glory of God, especially when we tell them that we are inspired by God and motivated by Him to do this work. A self-centered approach to work is about displaying our qualities and our achievements to say to people, this is who I am, I'm a self-made person. But a God-centered approach to work is about displaying the gifts that we humbly receive from God and using the services of others. And we don't need to brag about who we are or envy others and their promotion because the glory of God is the start and the finish of our work. It's the beginning and the end of what we do. Now, thirdly, Sunday worship and Monday faith are connected because both are honored and rewarded by God. Paul said to Christian slaves in Colossae, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. There is nothing wrong in working hard for rich rewards. The Bible acknowledges and encourages the relationship between good work and rich rewards. And there are lots of verses that say this and the verse that, We've read in Colossians 3 verse 24 is just another example among many. Paul is clearly saying to his readers that that if they work hard and work well and do so for the glory of God, they can be assured that God will reward them. In the New Testament, rewards are clearly presented by Jesus and the apostles as a motivation for Christian living and here in Colossians for Christian working. Michael Kruger a New Testament professor, recently asked, why don't we hear more about rewards in our modern pulpits? And his excellent answer is this. We have been convinced that our obedience doesn't matter. We are rightly told that only Christ's obedience can secure our justification and that he has kept the law perfectly for us And so our own obedience receives far less attention in the pulpit. Justification is the center stage and sanctification is peripheral. Now Kruger goes on to point out that while uh, Christ's work earns our salvation, that doesn't mean that our work does not matter. In fact, the purpose of Christ working to save us is to recreate us in his image to be workers under God working for God and working well. Our salvation includes our sanctification. And sanctification involves not only the transformation of us, but of our work, so that we are truly God's workmanship. Our obedience matters, and the fact that God will reward our work is an expression of the fact that God values what we are doing. Kruger cites John Piper's comments about this, and Piper, being very conservative, is one to listen to. And he said, it's terribly confusing when people say that the only righteousness that has any value is the imputed righteousness of Christ. Piper says, I agree that justification is not grounded on any of our righteousness, 
but only the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. But sometimes people are careless and speak disparagingly of all human righteousness, as if there was no such thing that pleased God. They often cite Isaiah 64 verse 6, which says, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But when my children do what I tell them to do, I do not call their obedience filthy rags, even if it is not perfect. And neither does God. All the more because he himself is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. So he does not call his own spirit wrought fruit rags. Do you see your work as a product of the Spirit of God working in you to do what is pleasing to God, a faithful service which He desires to reward? And that's why the Apostle Paul reminds us that we do not labor in vain. So, in closing, let me state again the three ideas that connect Sunday worship to Monday work. Three ideas that help us to regard sacred and secular work as one and the same. One, both worship and work are about service and serving. Two, both worship and work are for pleasing God and fulfilling His purposes. We worship God most when we glorify Him through our work. Thirdly, both worship and work are highly honoured and richly rewarded by God. Whatever you do, work in it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving.